What's up, guys? So if you've been listening to the podcast or watching the YouTube videos, you've probably heard my latest lecture on testicular torsion. Well, I thought it'd be pretty sexist of me to only lecture on how to save a testicle. So today we're going to talk about ovarian torsion. But before we do, I just want to take a quick second to reintroduce myself to our new listeners out there. My name is Gray Phelps, and I'm an emergency medicine physician assistant practicing in South Carolina. I've recently partnered with the founder of PA Boards, Andrew Reed, and we're both extremely dedicated to bringing you guys as much free content as possible via the YouTube and podcast. So if you aren't already subscribed, go ahead and do that now for weekly lectures. Briefly, let's talk about the normal female anatomy so that we can fully understand the mechanism behind this gynecological emergency. Here you can see that the ovary is naturally suspended by the infundibular pelvic ligament, also known as the suspensory ligament of the ovary. Other supporting structures to the ovary include the utero-ovarian ligament, which you can see attaches the ovary to the uterus and the broad ligament. The ovarian blood vessels then travel through the suspensory ligament so you can start to appreciate how torsion in this region can predispose to cessation of blood flow. Ovarian torsion can be defined as complete or partial rotation of the ovary on its surrounding ligaments cutting off the blood supply to the ovary. The fallopian tube oftentimes will also twist along with the ovary. When this happens, it's more commonly referred to as adenexal torsion. If ovarian torsion is not recognized and treated urgently, it can result in loss of ovarian function, infertility, necrosis, peritonitis, hemorrhage, and rarely sepsis. The primary risk factors for ovarian torsion are going to be any disease process that predisposes the patient to form an ovarian mass. However, torsion can occur in the absence of a mass, which we will talk about shortly. You can remember the risk factors for ovarian torsion by the mnemonic pelvic pain, where the first P stands for PCOS, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can cause multiple cysts within the ovary, increasing the weight and size of the ovary. E stands for elongated utero-ovarian ligament, which is thought to allow excessive ovarian movement and twisting, although this has never been confirmed. L stands for ligation, such as a tubal ligation. V stands for volume of mass. The bigger overall volume of the mass makes torsion more likely to occur. However, really large masses might be less likely to cause torsion because its volume impedes movement. And I stands for increased mass. C stands for size of the mass, that's C-I-Z-E. And torsion is more likely to occur with an ovarian mass five centimeters or greater, but it can occur with any size. P stands for pregnancy, usually secondary to a follicular or corpus luteum cyst that occurs with the normal function of the ovary during pregnancy. These will usually resolve on their own by the second trimester, but they do predispose the patient to torsion. A stands for age. Females usually of reproductive age because of the physiologic ovarian cyst formation that occurs. I stands for induction ovulation agents like Clomid, which can cause massive ovarian enlargement due to hyperstimulation or multiple follicular cysts. N stands for neoplasms. Benign neoplasms are going to be more likely to cause torsion. The reason being is because typically malignant masses tend to be more fixed in place. So now we know the risk factors that predispose the patient to torsion, but how are these patients going to present? Classically, these patients are going to present with acute onset of moderate to severe pelvic pain. It would be described as sharp, dull, stabbing, cramping, and might even radiate to the flank, back, or groin. This pain is typically going to be associated with nausea, vomiting, and a low-grade fever, possibly as a systemic reaction to adenexal necrosis. On physical exam of these patients, you will want to do a good abdominal and pelvic exam. These patients will have abdominal or pelvic tenderness to palpation, and a palpable pelvic mass felt during the bimanual exam. However, abdominal tenderness is absent in up to one-third of patients, and you may not have a palpable mass either. Peritoneal signs will be seen in a select few of patients. If this is present in the setting of a low-grade fever, this really should raise concern for adenexal necrosis. And occasionally, you might see some vaginal bleeding, although this is not typical. Laboratory analysis for all patients should include a CBC, CMP, and a quantitative and qualitative beta-HCG to rule out a topic pregnancy and also because the risk of torsion is increased during pregnancy. In addition, if you're concerned for malignancy, you should order tumor markers. Especially in the postmenopausal woman with an adenexal mass, you need to order a serum CA125. After the physical exam, you will want to order both a transvaginal and transabdominal ultrasound to visualize both the abdominal processes and to provide more defined images of the pelvic structures. Diminished or absent ovarian flow will lead to the presumptive diagnosis of ovarian torsion. However, this is important guys, only a definitive diagnosis of torsion can be made during direct visualization of a rotated ovary 
during surgery. So in the patient with acute onset pelvic pain, nausea, vomiting, low-grade fever, and an adenexal mass on ultrasound, you need to get your OBGYN on the phone immediately so they can take the patient to surgery for detorsion. Well, that's everything we're going to talk about today. If you have any questions or comments on how I can continue to improve the lectures, either leave a comment below or email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.